Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. <coughs> How do we uh, pronounce your names then? Is it is it Michael and App? Uh, well, you know, App uh, does the job for me. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's uh, it's actually Michelle. Michelle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was fifty fifty. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I listen to Michael oh, as well. <laughs> right, right, right. But yeah, I have a lot of problem with my surname because it's a German surname. But I grew up in, in the UK. My, my German grandfather moved to the UK. And uh, no one can pronounce my, my surname because it's Knabe. Ah, Knabe. Uh, okay. Knabe, yeah. So, and they're all like Nabe, Nab, Nabi, McNab. <laughs> I, I've had everything. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm used to listening for like these weird versions of my name. And, and then I moved to Germany. I moved to Munich for a few years. And I was like, finally, people can say like Herr Knabe and it works, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then uh, they can't say my first name in Germany. They always say Ellen. Yeah. They can't say Alan. It's always <laughs> Ellen. Like, well, you can't win, right? No, no, no. <laughs> can you hear me now? Henrik, hey, yes. Uh, yeah, Henrik. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see me also? No, no. Yes. Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> That's good with only three Henrik's. minutes left. Good stuff. Uh, Hem Henrik's easy, right? I can say Henrik. There's no... Yes. No need to work out how to say that name. Good stuff. So we got three so, minutes then. Yeah. Thanks, where, where are you guys uh, thanks based? Thanks, Alan, for, for moderating us. It's, uh, yeah. It's good to... <laughs> Good work. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's uh, it's interesting always to to be on the stage with with you guys. And uh, I asked for some hard questions for you guys because I think you need them. So no, let's yes. hope we get them. The people have been a bit uh, quiet today. Oh yeah, not so interactive. No. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, generally, if we're being honest to to the the Finnish guys, uh, they they don't generally speaking uh, ask that many questions, even in the conferences that are uh, in person. So uh, okay. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? So yeah. um, if there are some Finnish guys and you want to prove me wrong, please feel free to do so by asking some very hard questions. Oh. Yeah. I think we've got uh, like nine people in the room, I guess. I don't know. I think yeah. in, to in, in total, so in total there are... Yeah. yeah. That's it, that's it. Yeah. So let's, let's let this work up until the hour and then I guess we can kick off. Yeah. Cool. Hopefully people... I, I, I was um, a freelance journalist in, in 95 in the Ice Hockey World Cup. And this was yeah. the first year Finland ended up winning. Of course, I didn't know it while the tournament was going. But uh, so I, I had a journalist pass and, and I saw uh after each game they would have of course a press conference and uh, and you know the coaches and players would make some statements and then uh, would there be any questions nobody had any questions and then when the press conference was over then they would circle around uh, the finnish coach to ask questions right. uh, you know in finnish right. and and not in public but nobody wanted to ask yeah. questions uh, you know when when it was recorded All right Right. Yeah. This. This is. This is it. You but, know. I but, think it's also because if it's not your your first language as well, maybe. then it definitely has a. Has a but but notably, these pe people, their job is to ask questions. Like you. <laughs> right. Right. Like it's the one thing they do professionally. Right. And there's also you know the the Kimi Raikkonen thing as well when it's their job yes. to also answer questions and they're like yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's good. Okay, so it is uh, 4 p.m. So uh, let's count it down from 10 and uh, and begin. So uh, welcome to the roundtable with the Datastax guys. This is uh, Modern Data APIs on Cassandra. So let's do a quick round of introductions, starting from my top left, uh, Michelle. Uh, if you could uh, introduce yourself briefly. Sure. Hi, Alan. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Michel de Rue. I'm a data architect at uh, Datastax, which means that I'm uh, a technical lead for the region. Okay, cool. Eh? Hey, Alan. Yeah, my name is Ab Heiting. I'm uh, based out of the Netherlands, and I'm a salesperson for uh, Northern Europe at uh, Datastax. Okay, and Henrik. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Henrik Ingo, and I'm uh, EP of Engineering in EMEA 
for, for data stacks. And uh, I live uh, close to Helsinki. Those of you who know Finland, there's a town called Järvenpä by the railway. So um, I, I feel, you know, it's nice to have this conference in Helsinki, but it's unfortunate we are not actually there. Uh, so uh, happy to be here regardless. Yeah, next year, next year we'll all be in the same room together. Yeah. Exactly. That sure. would be great. Yeah, yeah would, it would. All right, so I'll set the stage a little bit for you guys uh, and ask a, a question again to the audience. You know, feel free to, to put some questions in uh, and we'll try and take those. Um, but let's kick things off in the meantime. Um, so so the, the point here is, you know, um, modern APIs, I'm very happy to see that because it shows that there's been some evolution in the API space. But um, first question is, you know, what, what would you mean by a modern API uh, and how have APIs evolved over the years? No, I can, um, I can say something about that. Um, or if you want to take it, Henrik, that's also fine. Yeah, go go ahead. I think you uh, you are in touch with what people are using, so let's start there. I, that would cool. have been my answer. All right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so so when uh, when you look back uh, back in the days, uh, a lot of integration work was done through um, connecting a programming language through a driver to a backend. Right. Um, it was uh, it was kind of. Um, yeah, it's quite, kind of a hard connection between a language and, and the backend. What we've seen now is that, that modern development stacks, they, they tend to, to go a bit different about integration. You know, within development and uh, modern development stacks, you see a lot of uh, REST endpoint integrations, for instance. Um, over REST, you see a lot of uh, GraphQL uh, implementations that, that even make it easier for modern developers uh, to use data regardless of, of the type of backend that the data is uh, uh, that the data is in and um, the backend that's persisting the data you know so um, obviously um, data stacks being top committer on uh, Cassandra open source you know uh, we we figured it was a good time to also open up Cassandra for modern APIs, um, and uh, that's uh, that's essentially what uh, what has been done. So uh, apart from the driver-based uh, integration that's still there, we now also have modern APIs like REST, GraphQL, and even a document uh, API right on top of uh, Cassandra. And I think that that's really important because it fits in in the need of um, developers. You know, developers nowadays nowadays they need ease of use, they need agility uh, to be able to to respond to market changes very quickly, and to be able to do that, they need to be uh, they need to leverage the right technologies. So I think that that's where modern APIs come in. Okay, and, and you mentioned uh, Stargate there. That's something I think you released last year, right? Um, you know, where does that that fit in here? Because you know you've been running, running Cassandra in the cloud for a while now. So, so what's the strategy with releasing Stargate? How does that fit in? So, so we released Stargate uh, as GA in in December, and and it's actually uh, it's still based on Cassandra code. So, those who know Cassandra better know that. One, one of the roles or components in Cassandra is called a coordinator, where, uh, which coordinates uh, execution of, of queries in the cluster. And, and Stargate is actually based on this. And, and what we have done is to make the coordinator standalone. And then in that, you can still use, of course, the Cassandra query language as before, but we've added other. So, so it's kind of a proxy server or, or API server however you want to call it. And, and behind Stargate, you still have the, the traditional Cassandra database nodes in, in the same cluster. Right. I, I, and is that that's open source, right? Well, yes. What was the strategy there? So, uh, so D Datastax, uh, we are uh, uh, many database companies kind of going back and forth on this question, but we, we are on a uh, determined path to, to be open source. So. Uh, 
because Cassandra itself is uh, uh, an Apache Foundation project, so it's naturally uh, open source and Apache license. But uh, but Stargate, uh, we we have done the same. So uh, so at Stargate IO, you can find all the repositories and uh, and bugs and everything is public. Uh, we we have other projects uh, at DataStax as well. Uh, Kate Sandra is, is our Cassandra distributor mm -hmm. for Kubernetes, or uh, or like Pulsar, which we uh, we just uh, started working with uh, at the beginning of this year, is is also an Apache project. So so it's it's core to our strategy. I, I think it's it's nice to mention because many other database companies currently are going a bit in the opposite direction, away from open source licenses. So. Uh, we actually did that some years ago, so maybe we are like a bit ahead of others, and we saw that, by the way, uh, maybe that wasn't a good idea in, in every way. Uh, the, the one thing I think from a business strategy point of view weighs uh, a lot here is that, of course, we are living now in an era where people are shifting to the cloud. So, so everybody, we, we have uh, Astra is our Cassandra as a service uh, product, and and we feel that there, uh, uh, it, it benefits us uh, to, to create as much momentum as possible for the Cassandra community so that, so that the whole ecosystem grows. Uh, and, and that way we, we benefit commercially when people want to use our cloud service for their apps that use Cassandra, either in a classic way or, or with APIs via Stargate. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. If if we come back to Starcade again and uh, just just maybe drill into a little bit more of the detail about you know how how you're going to use Stargate to actually um, you know build modern APIs, uh, or maybe if one of the other guys wants to answer that. Then Ed, you haven't said anything just yet. Well, then you know, I I can mention something about it. But Michel is way way more equipped than I do, so okay. uh, I, right. I get, I get right. the floor to him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, Seb. That's, uh, that was an easy one for you, right? Um, uh, no. <laughs> well, let, let, let me first say say another thing about Stargate also, right? So, so you know, yes, Stargate is open source, and uh, Stargate makes it easy to, to connect to a Cassandra backend uh, from a, a modern development stack. Uh, but there's now a whole other thing to Stargate also, and that's the, the fact that it's essentially modular. It's a pl pluggable... Um, uh, pluggable solution that would also allow uh, people to build um, uh, plugs for other persistent backends. You know, so the, the the idea about Stargate is to not just create a stellar development experience on top of Cassandra, but also offer that essentially on every type of persistence layer that uh, that's there right that's that's really the goal uh, for stargate to become well i hope the de facto interface with with for modern development languages right mm -hmm. that's um, that's the idea so yeah it's uh, we're open to 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 pull requests uh, to ideas about uh, other uh, backends as well so alan uh, i i think uh... <clears throat> one uh, one answer that comes to mind, uh, also to your opening question, mm -hmm. uh, if we think about uh, how does it look when you would build an app uh, or, or build some uh, API service with Stargate? Um, I, I've been in the database industry a, a long time, and I, I think a, a shift that is happening now is that traditionally you would have these, uh, uh, for, for each database, you would have a, 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 some kind of driver library that you, yeah. you can connect uh, to the, like JDBC or, or whatever that, uh, that helps you connect to the, uh, to the database backend. And, and what we see increasingly in, in modern applications actually is that, that the application, let's say a mobile app, uh, would not do that. Rather, you, you connect over HCP. And, and with Stargate, we are kind of bringing that forward one more step. And we are not the only ones doing this where uh, even like in the middleware layer, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily need a database-specific library to connect your database. Rather, you know, you, you can use uh, REST API as one of the options. E even mm -hmm. the other, like um, uh, schema-less uh, or document API that we offer, which is a, a, a JSON, like a document database. So, 
so you could compare it to to MongoDB, for example. But uh, but the the thing is, it's different. There also the uh, the way you would connect is over HTTP. So uh, so any any application could just you know get and put uh, JSON documents uh, without needing to depend on on some uh, some library which may or may not exist in your language. So this uh, this lowers the barrier, I, I think, to to start okay. uh, developing with with methods that you already are familiar with. Right. So if if you're a developer, um, say I don't know if there's some developers maybe in the audience now who who may also have the question now. How, do you have any tips for them on you know getting started on 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 how to develop against these uh, you know data models? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, uh, of course, now with Stargate, uh, you, you have different options, so it, it comes a little bit <clears throat> what is your favorite as well. And, uh, and th there is a spectrum, the Cassandra, although we are a NoSQL database, actually we are traditionally very similar to relational database. So there are tables and there is a query language that uh, resembles SQL a little bit. And mm -hmm. now with Stargate, uh, you, you have uh, if you think about REST and GraphQL, they, uh, they, they in a way, define a schema or a structure, typically. Mm -hmm. But they are more uh, more lightweight uh, and, and loosely coupled. Uh, and then at, at the other end, we have this document API, which is the schemaless approach. So uh, personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of doing using that, uh, which means you can, as you develop, uh, you, you create some data models in your applications. Uh, okay. And in, in many languages, it's, it's fairly natural to just serialize them as JSON objects and, and store in the backend database. So, so your, uh, it's, it's a very, the, the development process is very different when you go from one to the other. So if, if you start with a relational database or, or traditional Cassandra, typically very early in the project, you need to spend a day or, or maybe a week even to, to plan uh, your database schema, that to where is all the data going to go, and then you can write code yeah. that you, uses the schema. And uh, and with a with a schema less approach, uh, it's the opposite. So you start writing code, and the database kind of follows what, whatever you put in there. And and then of course, yeah. when you get closer to production, you need to maybe think a little bit more that what is like what, what is this mess I actually have in my database, and and clean it up a little bit so that you. Uh, you in the end want to define some kind of schema uh, anyway, so there, there is some order to it. But but it's much more fluid and agile during the development process. Okay, so so that's a, a good sort of intro to my next question then, because um, if you do build an app, I, I mean I'm building something now with my team, and and we're also schemaless, and it's great because as a product owner, I can turn around and change my mind five times a week, and and the developers don't complain. Whereas in you know the past, they would like exactly. have a hissy fit and be like, I have to change my data model now. But let's say if we have a, a you know it's a raging success, um, how is that schemaless approach going to scale? Right? Is it is it something I really need to address very early on, or can I sort of let it let it flow? Uh, in, in my experience, this is uh, uh, this is a strength of many uh, NoSQL databases. It it's kind of defines the NoSQL category, and, and Cassandra is is very strong uh, in in scaling, uh, especially to, to large clusters. And uh, and it, it's more a property, I would say, of the backend product you choose. So so there is, however, with the with the document model. Uh, there is a, a property that helps with scaling as well in that you typically store larger objects together. So uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the relational model, you typically break down your objects into multiple tables. And, uh, and this, uh, well, and then when you query them, you need joins and, and fairly complex queries. And this is harder to, to partition and, and scale out over a larger cluster. And uh, uh, when when you serialize your object into uh, into larger uh, JSON documents, you have more data together, and and well, it's more denormalized. So so then uh, data access is more straightforward, and and these objects uh, often are are easier than to uh, to partition over a, a larger database cluster. 
All right, cool. I, I think we should give uh, Ep a chance to say something as well. Oh, so, no. uh, uh, it's, it's good content. So, but if you have a great question for me, I will. I will definitely give it a go. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's come back to, to the actual title of, of the the talk, right? You know, yes. modern data APIs on Cassandra. You know, and also the fact that you've said data APIs and not you know APIs a product or anything. What's um, what, what? How does that resonate with you? With me, that's a good question. <laughs> so it is a very broad topic, and can talk about it for days, of course. No, but uh, <laughs> but, but my, a little bit about my background. So so I actually come from the API management space. So I've been always been uh, working with API with companies like working for Apigee and uh, Kong. Um, yeah. So you know, I know how important it is for 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 developers. You know, to create good APIs that uh, that you can uh, you know leverage in your in your in your projects. Um, so coming back to the topic of today, yeah, modern data and APIs. If you can combine the world's far most powerful database, you know, and you can combine that with a with a very developer friendly interface, I think that's re that's really a, a, a match made made in heaven here. And that's um, that's that's uh, that's what Stargate is intent is. And without looking at all the technical details, what you want to do is basically you want to uh, make sure that the developers can choose their language that they like. Um, and have one single foundational uh, data store there for that has um, that can be used for multi-purpose uh, multi-purpose projects. Um, you know that's that's what we try to achieve with uh, with Stargate. And that's going back to the title. Eh? That's the modern modern data APIs on Cassandra. What we now uh, what we now have available with the, with the, with the Stargate um, platform. Yeah. Okay, and and then another follow-on question would be um, with Graph. GraphQL APIs, is that something that's complementary here or is it, you know, something just completely different? Yeah, I think it's, yeah. Michelle, you want to give it a go, but I think it's complementary, right? You, it's, I mean, the GraphQL, you see more and more these days, eh? the people using first rest and see GraphQL popping up more in, uh, in projects. Uh, but you, yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, and it's also just briefly come back to another question that you had, you know, how, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you start off easily with, uh, with Stargate? You know, essentially there are two ways to do that. First of all, Stargate, you can just download it and run it within your own uh, laptop or Docker environment or uh, virtual machines or Kubernetes. The easiest way really for people uh, online to, to try it out is to use Astra, right? So Astra is a managed service, managed Cassandra service. Uh, uh, by uh, by DataSex and it includes Stargate. Uh, you s you can sign up for it uh, for free. Um, you get twenty five dollars uh, of credit every month. Um, takes you two minutes to sign up and you can uh, you 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 can set off using those cool new APIs. Um, so. GraphQL, if you want to use uh, uh, GraphQL, this this is a really easy way to do that. Now, if you look at Cassandra, Cassandra has always been um, a wide row uh, data model, right? Um, so there are essentially on Stargate, there are two APIs uh, that utilize or tap in into the value and uh, the promise of the wide row model. Uh, the first of, it, first of them is the, the REST API. The REST API allows you to integrate with it like you usually would do with CQL but now mm -hmm. without knowing CQL as a language. So that's really nice. It provides an abstraction layer. GraphQL, the rest and uh, the, the endpoint GraphQL also allows you to tap into the value of the wide row model, right? So with GraphQL, it's essentially an industry standard that allows a developer uh, to, to write a query on top of a backend without having to understand how the backend works, you know. So, both GraphQL endpoint and the REST endpoint are available for the wide row modeling within uh, within Cassandra. Um, Henrik already talked uh, uh, quite a bit about uh, the document model. So that's the third API that's available on Stargate, and that's okay. a whole new concept, right, on Cassandra. Cassandra has always been known about wide row modeling. The document API allows you to run schemaless JSON data on top of uh, Cassandra, also. Yeah, yeah. So, so I hope that Michelle, makes sense. Um, what what you are saying is the, the the REST and GraphQL in a way exposes your Cassandra tables. 
with yes. with semantics of those APIs and and uh, uh, the document the API on the other hand stores if, if you choose to use the document one this stores data in its own specific way so it's you, you kind of choose either that one or, or the, the two first ones very cool so, so what do I get for my 25 euros if I sign up what's that what do I spend that on <laughs> Ah, so this has uh, this has changed. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can spend it, Alan, on your uh, next groundbreaking uh, cool application that's going well, to take over the world. Yeah. It is, you know that. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing uh, we we uh, we released uh, uh, week. It's actually two weeks ago now that it's Monday. Uh, we we have also been working on a, what we call a serverless version of Cassandra, although there are still servers behind the curtain, but, uh, mm -hmm. but we use this to, to mean the pricing. So, so we have uh, introduced uh, like per operation pricing in, instead of hourly pricing. And I, I think, you know, Alan, if, if you want to start on your hobby project and, and you just work on it in the evenings and, and weekends, this is nice because then you, you don't pay for, for all the hours that you are not using uh, the database cluster. So. Uh, right. The, this, uh, the, uh, although this has been available, I, I would say in public clouds, uh, it's this type of pricing has typically been available only for the kind of vendor-specific uh, uh, proprietary services, and this is the first time we are bringing it to one of the open-source databases. Yeah. And it can run on any cloud, eh? so at least uh, you know Google, um, AWS, and uh, Azure. That's why you don't have any lock-in. So you basically we offer the same uh, pricing schema serverless as the cloud vendors do, but to your cloud of your choice, and it can even be interconnected between you know, multi clouds uh, and multi regions. Yeah, oh. yeah that, that's quite common now. Is that there's stuff running everywhere and it just speaks to one another, right? That's the world we live in. Yeah. That's and cool. It's quite uh, quite important for for your database layer. Often, you know, in, in the application stack, you might have. Uh, you, you know, your mobile apps or, or web apps may be running on one cloud service and then another cloud service is better at the kind of machine learning. So you done those there. Uh, but often uh, you, you, you need the same data. So you, you need some way to, to have the data layer integrated or moving across the clouds. And, and uh, that's uh, something we are uh, focusing on very heavily. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. That's about all we've got time for now. Um, it was a very interesting uh, talk. And uh, yes, in my um, next great app, uh, I'm sure I can see if I can spend my 25 euros on uh, something from you guys. But yeah, thanks a lot and uh, see you next